Hey everybody, it's Scott here with another episode of Strength and Health TV. And I'm really excited today. I've got my good friend, Delane Ross here. So this is gonna be the first episode that I've actually done a little bit of an interview. So you guys are gonna be happy. You're not gonna to have to stare and listen to me talk at you for this entire episode. So really excited to uh, introduce Delane and have her talk a little bit about her experience. So Delane, thanks so much for being here. Could you uh, start by telling everybody a little bit about yourself? Well, thanks for having me. Um, in the fitness industry, I'm a little bit weird because I kind of came in the back end. I uh, was an athlete doing competitive cheerleading, a lot of gymnastics, some soccer, um, college dance team, and I never really felt the need to go work out at a gym. But then when I graduated, I kind of got sucked into the LA fitness world and two hours a day, six days a week, like running on this thing that moves underneath me when the ground doesn't move outside and doing this a million times, which I've never done in real life. And then I bought all these fitness books and they contradicted each other and I had no idea what I was supposed to be doing. And so fast forward, I moved to San Diego, all of a sudden I have a 12 hour work day and I heard about these things called kettlebells that were three times a week for 45 minutes is all you needed. And it was too good to be true, but it was weird and I'm kind of weird. So I checked it out and it was like the heavens opened up and non-sport made sense. It's like, pick up heavy things, you get strong, pick them up fast, you get lean. Like that's the, the secret to the strength universe for me. And that was kind of the end. Like that was almost ten years ago. And okay. I so, went back. so that's how you got. So you were introduced to kettlebells. You're out in San Diego. You said, uh, what? Uh, I guess what was your first? Because uh, you were doing was it fitness competition or something prior to that? Or uh, after, after. Oh, after. Okay. So, uh, what was your first when you compared it to those days, like going to LA Fitness and stuff like that? And obviously, you were following a little bit more of like. A, isolation body type, you know, like a bodybuilding style workout, I guess, would be a lack of a better term. Uh, how did, you know, what were the differences between how you were training with kettlebells or how you were taught to train with kettlebells and what you were doing with the LA Fitness crowd? I hate to use the word functional, but honestly, like, when I found kettlebells, I was like... I think it's a good word. I mean, I, it, it, you know, yeah, it's overused, <laughs> but I think what you're trying to say, I think it's a good broad, yeah. I mean, like I was just saying, like I don't pick things up like this, and I don't pick up five pound things like this. I pick up, you know, if I'm picking up my groceries or picking up my friend's kids, you use your whole body to squat down or hinge right. and pick up everything. So muscles work together in everyday life. So why not train them that way in the gym? It's a novel concept, right? No, no, <laughs> no. I mean, you know, let's let's talk about the word functional for a minute. I mean, I, I guess you know, you that, my hang up and probably the same hang up that you have with the word is the way it's overused and the way it's so generalized. There's no, to me, there's no broad, just functional spectrum. I mean, I get, you know, when we talk about kettlebells, because I'm a big fan of lifting kettlebells, um, functional meaning we're using multiple joints, we're doing movements the way the body's designed to work, for lack of a better term. But functional could be, you know, doing those machine bicep curls could be functional for a bodybuilder who just needs right. bigger biceps. Right. So I think that's, you know, when we talk about functional in the industry, it does get, you know, unfortunately, you know, when you and I say we probably chuckle because we think of standing on like a balanced disc and closing our eyes, touching our nose, and that's what people are passing off as functional. But really functional just dictates, you know, is what you're doing going to help you accomplish, you know, your goals. So, so obviously isolation work could be, you know, for a bodybuilder, but for the average person, uh, I think this type of training is a much better approach because it does, like you said, when you bend down to pick up your groceries, you, just, you bend down to pick up a big thing, a cat litter, it's a, it's a very multiple joint a lot of muscle movement patterns, so that's kind of that was your approach to kettlebell training. It just it just made sense for the first yeah. time. Sure. Now, how did how did your training? I, I see. I I was a little unclear. I thought you had had went from fitness competition to this type of training. So since you did your fitness competition after you started this type of training, did it uh, did you still do some of the isolation work, or did you just do this type of training to get ready for the show? Well, I did three. I did three shows. My first one, I did everything they told me. Um, so yeah, the isolation muscle. They yeah. let me do some kettlebells, but like they made me do that stuff too. And then I followed the diet that they told me to follow, which was maddening, like counting every single macro, yeah. every single spreadsheet has to add up at the end of the day. If you don't have enough fat, you gotta drink olive oil because yeah, right? you've had all your protein and carbs, but not enough fat. Sounds awesome. Oh yeah, it's great. <laughs> um, and then the second one I did, I'm like, I'm not gonna listen to them on the exercise. Like I got that part down, so I used only kettlebells and did their diet. And then the third one, I did my own version of what I thought healthy eating was with kettlebells, and that um, actually placed the highest in that show. Really? Any of the three. That's awesome. So what, what division, because I know there's multiple divisions that females can, what was this? Was it figure? Was it fitness? What, what was the like, uh, classification that you were in? I did uh, both fitness and bikini. Fit, okay. Okay. Um, what are some of the differences um, that they look for? Because I know, you know when you're talking about a physique sport like that, obviously 
they're not looking at a bikini competitor the same way they're looking at a bodybuilder. So, so how do those divisions break down? Basically the density of the muscles. So a bodybuilder is going to be obviously more ripped, cut, thick. You're going to see all their lines, um, figure a little bit less, and then fitness, basically like the people who are in magazines. Sure. sure. Maybe a little bit leaner, but, yeah. and then fitness, probably a bikini or a figure person would fit their look and then your routine is obviously okay. the important part. Cool. Um, so, any aspirations to go back into that? No. <laughs> uh, what, what we don't know about Delane is she's the hardcore runner-up state champion in arm wrestling in Georgia, right? <laughs> By default. By default. Hey, you know what? <laughs> Since nobody else showed up that day, you earned that second place. Uh, so, um, what about, let's talk a little bit about business and stuff like that, because I know you, you were out in California. But you went to school here, right, at Georgia mm -hmm. Tech? Georgia Tech. Um, then you went to California, you came back, uh, and started your fitness business here. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Um, well, that was interesting. So, like I was saying earlier, I, I wasn't in the fitness industry when I was living in Atlanta. And so I basically moved back with a giant mortgage payment, zero customers, no one knowing me from the industry. I was like, hey, I'm open, come on, come on in. And my business coach is like, why don't you play into like some of your business skills? I'm like, I don't have any. Like, I was just passionate about what I did, and it attracted yeah. people, and they stuck around. Sure. So I don't know how to tell anybody to run a business except for you just gotta love it. So what did uh, what, what did you do? What was your uh, I mean, what, what was your business? Uh, uh, it was kettlebell gym. It was uh, we required one intro class just so everyone would know all the exercises okay. before they started, um, and then it was group fitness mainly. Awesome. Did you do any uh, personal training or private training, or was it mostly just? Mostly preparation for certification, so people who wanted okay. to get certified, I would work with them, but not a lot of ongoing private training. So like for uh, uh, for the different kettlebell certification organizations out there that required like a snatch test or something like that, right. they'd come to you and work with you to help them prep for that? Kind right, of, and like, oh, cool. is my form correct? Am I yeah. doing this right? So you knew as, as an instructor with those organizations, you knew what they were looking for, so you were able to prep these. That's awesome. That's really cool. Um, how, <clears throat> what's your take um, on like the Atlanta area, uh, as far as like kettlebells and how they've been kind of received down here as a form of training and stuff like that, do you see it as more of like a fad thing for this kind of area or is, is it something that got really popular for a while and then kind of went away? What's your take on the whole uh, kettlebell training in the Atlanta area? Well, to me, it's just a tool to pick up. Like right. barbells are great, kettlebells are great, body weight is great. Just find something heavy to pick up and I just think it's whatever resonates with you. Like yeah. I would be happy with a 24 kilo kettlebell in my back seat for the rest of my life. Like, sure. That's all I need. Um, but you know, some people need variety in their life and some people need other things. Um, it's just a tool. Yeah. How did, uh, how did your, your students and your clients and people that would come train with you, uh, especially if they didn't have experience with it, how, how did they, you know, if they were coming from that typical isolation type bodybuilding type workout or that was their experience, how did they uh, transition into the more, you know, full body, ground based, you know, kind of flowing exercises that are sort of so typical with kettlebell lifting? I think it's the same as me. I came from that background too and I just had never been exposed to something like that. And, um, they either got it or they didn't, and if they didn't, they left, and if they did, they stuck around. Yeah. So if they liked it, they were in. If not, they were back to LA Fitness. And, and that's fine. It's not for everybody. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and that's been kind of my experience too with kettlebells here. You know, I just think Atlanta's kind of this weird city. It's like, first of all, we get stuff about six years later than like New York and LA and stuff like that. And it's funny to see nothing really sticks and stuff like that. So it's it, it, you know it's just funny to see the different fitness fads and the trends that come. And I think. Crazy enough, the only thing that's really stuck long term here is Zumba. So, yeah. <laughs> um, so all right. So I know that you've had a little bit of a, a change uh, in your professional life and stuff like that. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about what you're doing now and and you shut down your training center and what what you're moving into? Um, yeah, I it got to the point where training trainers was really my passion, and it was for a couple of reasons. Um, one, they're super into it, and it was, I actually had a meeting with one of my um, former instructors who just opened up her own gym this morning, who was uh, one of the assistants at the certification two weeks ago, and she's like, I don't understand how you would come from an event like that where people are super into it, super invested, back to, I just want to talk and chew bubble gum and like yeah. lift something light and, you know, get a workout in. And I was like, honestly, that was one of the big things for me. It's like, it was, it was so hard to go from people who just cared so much about it to people who... Yeah. didn't really and then the second thing is like if I have a gym I can affect maybe a hundred people but if I can teach a workshop for ten instructors who can each affect a hundred people that's a thousand people and that's a whole ripple effect so yeah, absolutely um, I feel like I'm making more of a difference doing this and I'm also sure. doing what I now have moved into 
being passionate about. Yeah, and that's such a big thing, you know, I mean, I think any, even outside of fitness, you know, regardless of, you know, your business and stuff like that, we both have friends who, you know, do a wide variety of things for themselves, and it's, you know, definitely having that love, because when you do it, you're, you're beyond married to it, and you're doing it all day, every day, there's really no, you're no longer doing the, the nine to five, 40 hour a week thing. So definitely being passionate about what you're doing is a huge thing. So now what do you do? I mean, are you just traveling uh, around the country doing these workshops and stuff like that? Or you, what, what's, what, are, are you doing anything online or are you doing any consulting? What, what are you specifically doing right now? Um, two parts, uh, mainly traveling. Um, at least once a month I'll go teach an instructor course or workshop, but I'm also, it's in the, it's a, actually it was supposed to be finished two months ago, but the editors aren't quite done yet. But it's a big digital course, basically how to be either a rock star student or a better instructor. Cool. So it's almost, I think it's going to end up being about five hours long. That's awesome. Um, but it's how to teach, how to fix the common mistakes, how to program design, and if you don't feel like programming, six follow alongs that people can use in their class or for themselves. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that's cool. Uh, let me, uh, let's shift gears a little bit here. Um, because I, I know I got an idea what your opinion is going to be about this, and I think it's something that, that really needs to be addressed uh, just kind of in the, the state of the fitness industry and stuff. Uh, when we talk about, I know you're a big fan of lifting weight, and, and when we talk about weight, we're talking about just traditional barbells, dumbbells, free weight, kettlebells, uh, you know, staying away from machines, doing mostly the big compound movements and things like that. And I know that, you know, we've worked together on some of the lifts in the past. Um, you're strong, you enjoy those movements. Why is it important for women when they look at training to consider, you know, making a, a significant part of their training program, heavy weights, compound movements? One, why is that important? And two, you know, let's talk a little bit about this myth that, you know, women, that they're so afraid. And I think it's changing, but there still are, you know, you still see some hesitation with women when it comes to lifting weights. They're afraid to get bulky. They're afraid to get, you know manish you know muscles and things like that and that's just not going to happen so let's talk about those two things one why it's important for women to consider that training and two you know let's crush that myth a little bit a uh, couple reasons why it's important for women to be strong like one i don't want to have to depend on anybody else to do stuff for me like when i was in uh, corporate america still and i was still in there for a while when i first started kettlebells like, I was the only girl who could change the water cooler at the office. And it's like, come on, guys. Can you, can you just do something? And they're like, And hydration's oh, important. So. Right, yeah. true. Absolutely. Um, and then two, muscles is what muscles burn calories. So if people want to be thin, you've got to have muscles to increase your metabolism. And just sure. being a, I don't want to say a rat on a treadmill, it's really people think that it's going to get them to their goals. But what you really need is muscle so you can be burning calories when you're not doing that. Yeah, it's definitely, it's more metabolically active, so, and, and uh, you know, then the other benefits, too, you know, especially, you know, you hear about, and I'm not a big science guy, but you do hear about, especially as, you know, particularly when women get older and they start looking at things like osteoporosis and stuff like that, strength training is going to help combat that, so, um, what about, you know, this whole idea that, I mean, now, you lift heavy weights, and you certainly don't look like a man, so, <laughs> is it really that easy to build muscle uh, for, for women when they're, are, are they going to get just freaky, ripped, jacked, I mean, what, what, Let's talk about that myth a little bit. Oh my gosh, it's so hard to get jacked. I mean... I've been struggling with it. <laughs> and last time I checked, I was a guy. So I've been struggling with it, but yeah. I mean, when you use your whole body, you, you kind of... It fixes itself. Like, okay, when I started, my butt got a little bigger. My waist got a little smaller. It kind of just made me into yeah. the way I was supposed to be. Whereas when I was isolating muscles, even the lighter weights, like you would build a bicep with a tricep, but they're not actually talking to each other. Yeah. So not only are you making everything talk and work the right way... You're gonna get leaner and stronger as long as you're not like bicep curling 100 pounds, which nobody's gonna do that anyway. You know what you just said there is probably one of the the best things that I've ever heard and the best way to say it and and just just the the way to kind of wrap it up. You said your body fixes itself, you know. And when you're you know the idea she's talking about there is when we do when we do a squat, we're supporting the weight on our back by utilizing the muscles of our torso, the, the abs, the lower back, the obliques, you know, all this muscle here. Then we're using the muscles of our hips, of our knees, of our ankles as we bend those joints to lower and lift the weight. That's a lot of muscle being recruited. So it's all going to kick in what it needs to kick in to produce that movement. Now, if I sit down on a leg extension machine, I'm just isolating that thigh muscle. And, and from the looks of it, I need to do a little bit of that. Or if I get on that leg curl, I'm isolating that hamstring, but they're not working in unison. I love the way she said that, that they're talking to each other. And that's what the body does when we do a compound lift, like a deadlift, or we do a squat, or even a, a bench press, because when we're working multiple joints versus isolating those muscles. So that, that's probably one of the most brilliant 
the body fixes itself. And I, I, I can't remember, I think it might have been Pavel, who you're, you're a student of. I remember reading something by him where he was talking about the benefits of kettlebell training. And he, he made that same comment about how he didn't say the body fixes itself, but he says, if you need to put on a little bit of muscle, the body will build a little bit of muscle. If you need to burn a little bit of fat. So the body just kind of corrects itself when you're doing this type of movement. I thought that fixing itself is one of the most brilliant things. It's so simple, but it's, it's one of the most brilliant things that I've ever heard when it comes to you know, this idea of training and kind of kinetic chains and stuff like that. So that's pretty awesome. Um, so there you go, women. Don't be afraid to lift weights. The lane lifts heavy weights. She looks like a woman, uh, a healthy athletic woman, and she's a great arm wrestler. So we, we got to touch on this a little bit here. Uh, we, I, I got this brilliant idea. You know, we're, we're both living in Atlanta for a long time. We, we, you know, she had her business down in the city. I'm up here in the suburbs. And I just got this idea that, you know, she's, she's really cool. I'd love to do something with her. And there was a big kind of contest going on up in North Georgia, up in, in Dahlonega. Or not Dahlonega, uh, Dalton. And uh, basically what it was, it was the Georgia State Arm Wrestling Championships. And the promoter of the event is a friend of mine I've known for a long time. And he asked me if I could do a kettlebell competition up there. But we had just done a big meet, and it wasn't going to happen. So I said, this is a good opportunity to finally do something with the link. So we did a version of the Tactical Strength Challenge, which if you don't know is the, what is it? Tell, tell us about the TSC. What is it? A uh, five-minute snatch test, max lift, powerlifting style, deadlift, and um, number of dead hang pull-ups, or flex arm hang for the novice women. Yeah, so we've got a few different divisions. Three cool events, um, all based on pulls, all based on you know big functional body movements. So I thought this might be a good fit. So I, I, I contact, hesit hesitated that I contacted and said, hey, you want it? And she said, yeah, absolutely. So we go up, and she just... If I admit, she became enamored with arm wrestling. She said, I could go out there and do that. And she got her opportunity the second year. Uh, she jumped up there and she got second place. So I know she's going to brush it off, but she did get up on that arm wrestling table and kick butt. So I did beat two people. She beat two people. But to get, was, yeah. first so, place was here and second place was hey, here. You got second place. So anyway, so it was good times. But the funny thing is, you've got an arm wrestling story. Uh, that was written about in what was, was it Dan John's book or was it Pavel's? They were together. Yeah. Easy strength. Uh, so this is actually kind of cool. Um, so, you know, again, this is, this is strength training. This is the things that, that it does. You, you don't, one, you don't build big hulking mannish muscles if you're a woman. That takes anabolic hormone, that takes testosterone, and women just don't have enough of it naturally to build those kinds of muscles. A lot of guys don't have enough testosterone to build the freaky big muscles. It does take anabolic uh, use. Uh, the other thing is too, the, and again, we're going to use this term, the functional strength, the everyday strength that this type of training builds. Uh, you kicked some guy's butt in arm wrestling at a local health food store, didn't you? I did. So what, what all happened there? Did you just walk into the store angry or did he, was he threatening you in some way? Tell, tell us the story because this is kind of awesome. Well, so. I, I had just come from teaching a class and I had like a hot pink and black, like tight fitting outfit and this guy was like... So did you just come from Pilates? And I was like, no. He was like, aerobics? And I'm like, no. He was like, well, what? I'm like, Russian weightlifting. Like, you don't look very strong. I'm like, you want to arm wrestle? He was like, yeah. And I killed him. You but just, just smashed him, slammed. It was so easy. But he was like this 17-year-old little wiry kid. But it was in the in the section of easy strength. It was in the whole big does not mean strong and strong does not mean big. So exactly. you can be one without the other exactly. pretty commonly. Yeah, definitely. So first of all, you 17-year-old uh, kids that are working at grocery stores show more respect to women when they come walking in. They're not all coming from Pilates. Uh, but yeah, th this whole idea that you you know strength isn't necessary. Now, that doesn't mean that the, obviously the super heavyweight powerlifters lift the most weight, okay? But you don't need to be massive to be strong to squeeze that much power out of your engine. And when you look at sports like powerlifting or weightlifting or even kettlebell sport, these are all weight class sports. You know, so there, there are people that have to weigh 132 or 123 or 114 or 220, and they've got to make, so they've got to be as strong as they can for that weight class, and you can certainly get strong. Strength is more of a nervous system response. It's not always metabolic, but having bigger muscle does mean it increases your, your ability to build strength. So for all you women out there that are afraid to lift weights because you're going to get too big, you're not. Just, you know, train the big compound movements, lift heavy, and lift smart.
So is there anything that uh, you want to kind of touch on or any, anything that you want to leave all seven of the people that watch this, this show with? I think you covered it. I appreciate you having cool. me. Cool. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you coming up. Now, where can, uh, if people want to learn more about you, your business, what you do, are there places that they can go to on the internet? Do you got a website? Any uh, social media? Trainwithdelane.com is the website, and I got a DVD and a book on Amazon as cool. well. All right, well, we'll I'll put some links to uh, her website and stuff on the uh, in the notes underneath the uh, video. So I definitely recommend checking her out. She's an awesome trainer and definitely a good friend, somebody I've been happy to uh, get to know over the last couple of years and hopefully do some more cool things with in the future. So, Delane, thanks so much for uh, spending some time with us. And uh, I don't know about you. You ready for some coffee? <laughs> yeah, I'm not too. All right. <laughs> thanks.